Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. We thought we would do a segment today on attention deficit disorder, uh, ADHD, um, because for the, the very reason that when I interview people who have been diagnosed with dementia, they often tell me that in hindsight, um, an ADHD type of uh, symptom presents itself um, at a very early stage. Uh, so we thought we would delve into that a little bit deeper to really understand what the connection is between ADHD and dementia is. So I'm happy to have with us Professor Sandra Coy. She comes from um, Amsterdam University and she is a specialist in ADHD. Thanks so much, Sandra, for joining us. You're welcome. Nice to have that you have me here. <laughs> So let's let's talk a little bit first about symptoms of um, attention de deficit in um, older people. I mean, we we usually associate ADHD with children, but what do we know about how it presents itself in, in older people? Yeah, well, ADHD was historically a childhood onset disorder, and so we know it from boys that cannot sit still, that are talkative hyperactive, impulsive, and inattentive at school, and that have difficulty uh, um, finishing school and making homework, and that may have, may have mood swings and anger outbursts. And nowadays we know that uh, it's not only prevalent in boys, but also in girls. And we learned that it's not outgrown in, in adulthood. So my specialism is on ADC in adulthood, and I started 25 years ago to find out about the symptoms, the impairment, the comorbidities, the treatment. And I did my PhD on adult ADHD in the Netherlands. But uh, I realized that ADHD it may not be outgrown after age 18, but even not later. So let's say at age 65, what happens to people with lifetime ADHD with a childhood onset? Are they, out, are they outgrowing ADHD by then? Well, this was this didn't really make sense to me, and I already had seen a lot of people older than 65 with similar symptoms as their children and grandchildren, because ADHD is a heritable condition in, mo in many families, not always, but in many families it is. So those older people came to me asking, is there still hope for me? I would like to sit still and concentrate for the first time in my life, and I see that my children and grandchildren can do that with the proper medical treatment. And is there still hope for me? So that always touches me when people really um, have been neglected all their lives with a condition that we now think is very well treatable and worthwhile treating because it reduces symptoms and impairment. So then the question about uh, how often is ADHD prevalent in older people? We studied that in the Netherlands in the LASA study, Longitudinal Aging Study Amsterdam. And we found that around 3% of the population in this study still fulfilled criteria for ADHD, the strict criteria. That means six of nine symptoms in childhood and still, and impairment. So that's really a strict diagnosis for older people because we know with age, the number of symptoms may be a little bit lower and still people may be impaired. And this combination makes the diagnosis, not only symptoms. So, Maybe it's even a bit higher. And you, you need to understand that um, the prevalence in children and adults is around three to five percent as well. So it's not very, very different. Uh, you're not outgrowing it, at least not uh, in the, on the population level. We, we find similar numbers. So this was recently discovered by our research, uh, let's say five years ago, and it was not known in the world of mental health or in geriatric psychiatry at all. So it's a new condition to be differentiated from dementia, cognitive decline, and so on. So I have to ask you this because um, when, so are these, this population, are you saying you don't really get ADHD later? It's like you've had it as a child and perhaps you know, you've managed it, and then maybe later in life it becomes uh, more more present. Is that the case? Well, in my country, still many adults with ADHD have never been diagnosed in childhood mm. because when they were children, uh, the diagnosis did not exist in their age group, or um, 
or it was, was, was a relatively unknown. So many adults have never been diagnosed and they get their diagnosed at first in adulthood. Same is an even more true for older adults because when they were young, ADHD was not there. And so it's, it's relatively new. It's not new, but it's the name is new and the condition that how we treat it is relatively new. And this is all historically. Right. What, 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 what actually, can we see an, I mean, can we do a scan of an ADHD brain and, you know, a, a normal brain? Or is there is there something we can see? Do we know exactly what is happening inside the brain to, we, um, yeah. to bring the around? The world would love to have a test, <laughs> including me. But uh, in psychiatry, this is very complex because there is a lot of variability between people and between conditions. And um, making a brain scan of me and you, um, maybe there will be tiny little bits of difference, but uh, we can only find differences on the group level. So having a group of adults with ADHD and a group of control people without ADHD, then you may find differences. Looking at brain scans, looking at neuropsychological tests, and we look also at genetics uh, nowadays, but the genetics is really uh, so huge, so uh, difficult to, to pinpoint to a, a few genes. There will maybe a thousand genes involved in ADHD. I lately heard from uh, a geneticist in my country. So uh, it's rather complex to, <laughs> to develop a simple test. So we, we, the diagnosis is always made based on a clinical interview, talking to the patient about lifetime symptoms and impairment, and with the family to add useful information about severity symptoms and the onset of symptoms because the memory of patients is usually not too good because if you if your attention is low it's also uh, implicating memory problems from childhood on so asking old people about their childhood behavior is hard in everyone but especially in people with ADHD that that may not remember ex actually how they behave what the difference was between them and others and so on do we know though, I mean, you know, just based on the interviews that I have done and when people describe in hindsight, you know, I always ask this question, well, in hindsight, were there signs of dementia earlier on, like many years before you've been diagnosed? And one of the answers that uh, does repeat itself, as I mentioned earlier, is that they couldn't hold their attention like they used to, right? They couldn't multitask as they used to. Like, you know, perhaps they were working on many projects at one time. They lost that ability and just attributed it to normal aging, right? As we age, our brains function different, differently. So my question to you is, is it possible that that could in fact be an earlier sign of dementia? Uh, well, usually people uh, um, ask for assessment for cognitive decline or fear of dementia when they perceive that their memory is going down or, or less well than it was previously. But in ADHD people, this has been there all their life, but may increase as well with aging and or cognitive decline. So it's complex. And the, the main difference is that patients sh should be able to tell you as a doctor whether they have had attention and, and memory problems all their lives and that it led to impairment at school, for instance, or uh, underachievement at work and all kinds of other difficulties. And then you have a lifetime course of inattention and memory problems, and that's definitely not dementia. That's definitely ADHD. ADHD is early onset and chronic cause. And it's not going okay, so away with age. It's not going end. away. But right. dementia and cognitive decline is typically starting later, maybe as early as maybe 45 if you if you have bad luck, but <laughs> then you still didn't have it before. So this this um, uh, information is crucial to differentiate both conditions. And I have to say, uh, recent studies show that people with ADHD history may have an increased risk for dementia. Now, so, why do we know why that is? Not yet. We there are, are a few studies only, uh, but it's very important for the world to know because doctors need to differentiate both conditions. So they need to know about ADC in older people in order to to reassure that it's really dementia and not 
a treatable condition like ADHD, which is important for every patient. Um, but um, where, what was I saying? Sorry, I lost so I, so I was asking you about, do we know what the link is between ADHD yeah. and dementia? Well, there are some indications that Parkinson's disease, which comes with dementia, um, uh, is increased in people with a history of ADHD. And there are connections to Lewy body disease dementia. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's around a two to three fold increase. Um, but it has to be confirmed in other studies, and we still don't understand a lot about the connection. So I want to go back. I, I want to go back to what you were talking, what you said a bit earlier about how people with ADHD, it's a lifetime condition, um, and they experience memory problems, right? Um, so, what are those memory problems like? with a typical ADHD uh, person um, who is who has ADHD? Well, for instance, they forgot they had a diagnosis of ADHD when they were age 10. So, so is it a I ask them, them is it, is did it you have long? these problems in childhood? I ask them and they, they don't remember. And then the partner or the mother tells me, well, he had a diagnosis of ADHD when he was age 10 and he doesn't remember. So this is rather crucial information uh, for retrospective assessment of ADHD. So people sometimes say, um, I would forget my head if it wasn't fixed to my body. So they forget appointments, time, things they want to do, things they would bring, uh, holidays, um, um, presents for friends and so on and so on. But it's not the short term memory typical for developing cognitive decline per se. It's more a chaotic, uh, chaotic lifestyle by not paying enough attention to the job that you're doing or the, or the conversation you're having or the task that you need to fulfill. Right. So now I want to talk a little bit about the treatments because, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, I mean, I, I often thought as a child I was ADHD, but it wasn't diagnosed, right? Um, but the way that I coped with and I, I haven't been diagnosed, but the way that I cope is I go running every morning and running it vastly improves my memory. And I, I know this just because when I miss my run, I can't concentrate in the way that I can when I run. Now, someone explained this to me because they said running is just setting off natural endorphins. And actually the ADHD medication is synthetic endorphins. Is that true? Well, um, I don't know whether it's natural endorphins related, but it's for sure that uh, movement and sports uh, improve um, uh, the restlessness of people with ADHD and, and also attention. So as long as you don't overdo it and you can run every day, not too hard and not too much, then you will be uh, injured and will, won't be able to continue. Uh, but this helps only for a few hours, as I've been told. So it's a temporary improvement that's, and I must say movement as sports is good for everybody's brain because it prevents all kinds of uh, illnesses in the, in the, in the, in later life. It's better for, to prevent obesity, which is another risk factor for dementia and so on. So healthy lifestyle in general, enough sleep in a healthy food and, and sports are, are the three main uh, drivers of uh, a better outcome for all of us. But so for, how you, yeah, how do you treat ADHD in older people then? Sorry? How do, how, what's the treatment for ADHD in older people? Okay. Well, we, we uh, studied that in the literature and we published that in 2016. And um, we found that there were only case studies on uh, small groups of older people being treated with stimulant medication for ADHD that we also use in younger people. And it, did see, it seemed effective. Um, the next step we did was uh, starting a protocol for uh, assessment and treatment of older people above uh, 55, uh, including cardiovascular assessment before starting the medication and monitoring those uh, the effects of medication during treatment. We did this in a naturalistic follow-up study, so it was not a randomized controlled trial. And we published this last year. And we found uh, that the 113 patients that we were able to um, to, to um, get the data from from the electronic files, 
that uh, around 62% responded favorably, favorably, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> positively, and uh, uh, they had similar side effects and issues as uh, younger adults. And um, uh, so it was very much reassuring that when you take into account hypertension and uh, other cardiovascular issues that older people have more often than younger people, it's safe. It seems safe and uh, responsible to um, to treat them. Probably with a bit lower dosages, as is common in older people. Uh, um, so you have to take care. And of course, this is not a final conclusion, as we need randomized controlled trials on older people to be sure. So, so if if ADHD, we have a question like, can symptoms of ADHD emerge at certain points in life, such as retirement? So let's say maybe you were diagnosed or you weren't diagnosed as a kid. You don't know you have it, but later on in life, uh, you know, you've you've managed to cope. And I, I I'm assuming there's different degrees of ADHD. Um, then does it reemerge? Can it reemerge maybe um, as you get older? Well, usually then there is a disbalance in factors that keep you uh, going. For instance, if your partner dies and you have to deal with the loss, but also with daily life, and suddenly you feel that there's something missing that's more than the partner alone, it's also the daily structure. And it's, it's uh, implicated in uh, how you spend your time, how, what you spend in money, whether you develop debts or whether you have difficulties due to those symptoms, it's it's possible that that it suddenly emerges. At least it's not not coming uh, for the first time in your life, but it's you're more aware of it because your compensation, your external compensation by the partner, has has gone, and then you suddenly are not no longer in balance, and then you may have difficulties. Same is true for women with. Um, in, during menopause, uh, this is one of my favorite uh, subjects to study further, because during menopause, uh, the estrogen uh, levels drop. And this is more on a continuous basis, getting down during 10 years. Uh, but uh, estrogen is, um, is a hormone that's, that enhances dopamine. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter involved in ADHD. And when both go down, because dopamine is low, we assume in ADHD people, and estrogen goes down, then you really get severe problems that you can't cope with. With everything you've learned in life, you can't cope. So this so, is the reason that many people, many women in during men, perimenopause suddenly decompensate, although they may have uh, been able to cope before and have never been diagnosed. So what happened? Okay, let's let's unpack that a little bit. So, yeah, uh, especially with women, um, and, you know, estrogen. We know as we approach menopause, um, there, we have different levels of decline in estrogen. Some women, you know, it's more severe. Other women, it's more gradual uh, in perimenopause and and menopause. Uh, but what what role? I mean, dopamine as a neurotransmitter. What role exactly? What does that mean? Um, what is dopamine doing inside our brain? Okay. Well, dopamine is uh, involved in uh, alertness. It's a waking agent. It wakes you up. It's a daytime hormone, I would say, or neurotransmitter. It helps you to make decisions, to have overview, to be able to uh, uh, relativate, and to, to, to see things in perspective. Uh, it, these are higher cognitive functions that are very important to all of us in order to to um, reduce stress, having overview. And people with ADHD, we think, have little, too little, too low levels of dopamine in the brain. There are many, many studies pointing in this direction, although we cannot measure it directly into the brain, of course. And dopaminergic agents that increase the level of dopamine in the brain, such as the stimulants, are very effective. In so is that some of the medication that people with ADHD are put on? Um, are, are, yeah. So you can supplement, like, like we, some people um, use uh, estrogen as they uh, reach menopausal age. You can also um, supplement dopamine. Is that correct? Well, you only won't get it unless you have a diagnosis of ADHD, I hope. Okay. <laughs> it's, not, yeah. it's not something to throw over the counter to everyone. Um, well, the perimenopausal uh, increase of ADHD is 
often accompanied also by mood symptoms like depression, perimenopausal depression, can be quite severe when you are low in dopamine and estrogen again. We studied that and published a paper on it last year by Dorani. If, when you're in test, you can find it on PubMed. Um, and we uh, found that women with ADHD have these issues in the week before menstruation, after childbirth, and in the perimenopausal period. Uh, what helps in general, for women in general, when they have such problems is an antidepressant or hormones continuously. So estrogen and progesterone continuously. So it's um, hormone replacement therapy is the usual way to, to go and it helps, uh, it helps a lot. But when there's also depression, SSRI may be added as well. So an antidepressant, SS, serotonergic antidepressant, I mean. Right. But it has to be studied in people with ADHD, but they're just like normal people, so why not? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we may not know the real numbers of people with ADHD out there, right? I mean, you know, not everyone is diagnosed, I think. Oh, no. There's a lot of under assessment and under treatment, yeah. Yeah. So... Um, I'm assuming these treatments, when you are diagnosed at an older age, are treatments that last, you, you, you constantly stay on, on medication, is that right? Well, uh, people always ask, how long do I have to take this? <laughs> and I always answer, uh, let's first give it a try and see whether it helps you at all and whether you can endure the side effects and what we have to do about the dose or the timing. and. Uh, eventually about other conditions that, that accompany ADHD often, like mood disorders, anxiety, addiction, sleep problems are highly prevalent. So it's, it's a whole package that we look at. And then when the patient feels better and he, um, he appreciates the, the effects on his functioning, then he's motivated to take it because when he stops, the symptoms return mm. immediately in a few hours. So, um, it's, it's not nice to tell people you need to take this during your lifetime. Nobody likes it. But if it helps you and it prevents uh, misery <laughs> and impairment and debt and, and divorce and whatever, and you are able to do what you really want in life, then it's, an, a, 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 well, you don't want to stop. But of course, acceptance issues, do I really have a chronic condition? Can't I really don't do it by myself? These issues are frequent. And uh, so we have to help people to consider their options and also to 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 accept themselves as they are. Uh, they're good. They are perfect, and they only need some support to function on the level they want. And that's all what medication does. Do you have a hypothesis as to why there people with ADHD um, may possibly be more susceptible? to dementia, or maybe I should ask you, how should we study that? Like, where should science go with that? That's a good question. Um, I think we should start with the screening for, uh, for ADHD in older people that come to visit a clinic for cognitive decline and or dementia, because we have no idea uh, what's underneath those, those referrals what people are really coming for cognitive decline and what people have ADHD and what, which people have both maybe. So in order to develop skills in the clinic for clinicians to, to consider all the, all the possibilities and to have, uh, have an interview to do that, the DIVA 5, for instance, this interview we made, it's online available, the diagnostic interview for ADHD in adults based on DSM-5. Uh, that's the acronym Diva Five. Diva Five. Um, where, how do we tell our people? Where do people find that? Are it's a website. It's www.divacenter.eu. Okay, so it's maybe Nicholas can. Um, my producer Nicholas can post that in the chat. Yeah. So uh, we're very proud because it's now a worldwide instrument in twenty-six languages. Wow. So, so the first step is figuring out what, how many people, um, as they age, have ADHD symptoms, and then how many. I, I guess that's very much. That's that's a lot easier to find out than um, who ends up with dementia and exploring the connection between the two. Well, who ends up with dementia? Therefore, you need a prospective longitudinal study uh, among the population. Yeah. And that's, that hasn't been done. It takes a lot of time. But to start in the, in the 
clinics for cognitive decline it would be an easy way to to raise awareness and to find out how to differentiate the two uh, or the combination in older people. But we do know that the prevalence of um, ADT in, in older age is 3%. Mm -hmm. That's what we already know in the population. But we, you wouldn't look at it as a, uh, a symptom, an early sign of dementia. It's more, I've had this condition and therefore it, it presents itself in older age. Uh, but no one is saying right now, or no one really knows, could this be an early sign of dementia? Well, um, the problem is uh, ADHD starts early and is chronic. So that's different from dementia with a whatever later onset. Um, but it can be combined in one person. So a person with ADHD might think of himself as now I really get dementia because it's, it, this, the severity is increasing. That's a good reason for asking help. Um, so it's not clear cut what is what. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's why we need scientists like you. So thank you very much um, for looking into this and for sharing um, insights. We'll post the link to that test for anyone concerned that they um, may have had may have ADHD um, in as they approach their older age years. Um, so thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you for sharing um, your insights with us, and we look forward to. Uh, you coming back as you learn more and as there's new, um, newly published studies. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. So if you um, want more, I, as I mentioned, we're going to post the link um, that Sandra mentioned about um, a, a test that you can take at home um, on whether or not you have ADHD. Um, we will, I, I'm actually personally fascinated by this topic just because of what I'm hearing from you. Um, if you want to hear more about other topics, make sure you write to us at info at beingpatient.com. We love your suggestions. Um, and if you missed any of this interview, it will be posted on Being Patient um, on our website, beingpatient.com. Um, don't forget to sign up for our newsletters because that's when we're gonna tell you about these upcoming talks and um, where we post the highlights from the week, uh, stories that we've covered. Thanks very much for watching everyone and have a great day. Bye.